radiologist is interested in radiation? Well, it's because of running the Chernobyl Tissue Bank. And I know many of you are far too young to remember Chernobyl, but I'm not going to talk too much about individual things that we do. I'm just going to give you a general talk about some of the problems that, that we have of communicating um, risks of, of exposure to nuclear uh, accidents and how actually it's quite dangerous and you overestimate the risks. So you can cause an awful lot of psychological damage. Okay, so we have a problem with radiation. Uh, there's a very long history. You are all too young. I, get, I feel incredibly old when I speak to audiences like you. But in the 1960s, we were bombarded with information about how nuclear, act, uh, nuclear weapons were going to kill our entire species. We were all going to die. It was going to be nuclear winter. It was going to be absolutely awful. So actually, we were made to fear anything to do with nuclear. But, counter to that, there's a general acceptance of medical radiation exposure and exposure to natural radiation. And to me, it's a little bit weird that the two nationalities that love sitting in spas, the Germans and the Japanese, are the ones that have the biggest fear of radiation. The Japanese may have some cause for concern there, but you do wonder about the Germans a little bit. I do wonder about the Germans an awful lot. Apologies to any Germans in the room. <laughs> there, there's a relationship with any toxin between dose and response. That's very simple biology. And radiation is a toxin. And it shouldn't really be considered something anything different than that. The perception that an individual dose from nuclear accidents is much, much higher than it really is. Uh, people tend to think that lots of radiation comes out of a nuclear power plant accident, and therefore an individual dose is very, very high, but that's actually completely wrong. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And the other problem that we have is much of what we base our understanding of exposure to a general healthy population to radiation on is the atomic bomb exposure. Now, an atomic bomb is not the same as a nuclear accident. They both go bang, but that's about it. The radiation that comes out is very, very different. So actually, an awful lot of the, the received knowledge that we have about radiation exposure to a general population comes from something that isn't an appropriate model. So we have a lot of problems. And of course, then we have the science fiction. Now, everybody knows Superman has his powers because he was bitten by a radioactive spider. And of course, Homer Simpson, great man that he is, and the nuclear power station he works in, and the three-eyed fish, which we all know you get in a pool where you've exposed them to radiation, don't we? But the problem is, because we've allowed that idea of radiation and health effects to take over in our minds, it leads to inappropriate headlines in the press when we have a problem with a nuclear power plant. And that causes far more damage than the actual radiation itself. Now, nuclear power has a definite image problem. Um, this comes from a very big poll conducted by Ipsos Mori. 23 different countries, 21,000 people. And the pros and the cons that they came up with, the pros, I think we'll all accept the pros. The cons, I think, largely stem from the first of that. There's a lack of information on nuclear energy. People find it difficult to talk about nuclear energy in schools. I've got two children who've been through the school system. And you should see some of the rubbish I saw in their textbooks. So we have a problem that the information that is out there, we're teaching our children is actually wrong, and we need to do something to address that. But I think the problem that we have most is that we worry about the impact on health, yet we're doing it from actually very little understanding of the scientific facts behind that, and the possibility of disaster. We've had two disasters in 25 years. In fact, I would take the term disaster. I think it's inappropriate. Fukushima was not a disaster because of the radiation. It was a disaster because of our response to the radiation and because of the tsunami. And you'll see how many lives were lost in the tsunami. But we tend to use words like disaster, which strike an emotive response in us, uh, when actually it's inappropriate to use that term. And of course, the long-term environmental impacts uh, safe disposal of nuclear waste. There's a big discussion in this country about going on about the geological disposal of waste. Do, should, should we really be burying it a kilometre underground? What's the reasons for that? Well, according to DEC, the reasons for that is in the next ice age, we might lose a kilometre of the Earth's surface when the ice age happens. I'm sorry, but when the next ice age comes along, we might well be digging the stuff up to heat our homes with. 
Uh, and I don't think I'd really be worried about that if I was going through the Ice Age. I think it has quite a few other things in my mind. But that's where a lot of this thinking comes from. Uh, the public perception of radiation is largely based on publications like this. This is the, the, the book that's quoted by all the Greens. 985,000 deaths from Chernobyl, mainly cancer. Well, I hate to tell you the one thing that all of you, I can guarantee will happen to all of you, is you're all going to die. There's no way around that. And if you take statistics like that completely out of context, probably 985,000 people have died since 1986 in the areas where radiation happened. But it doesn't mean that it's all due to the radiation. But if you take things out of context like that, you have a real problem. It's probably better to look at them like this. So this is a quote from Jim Smith, who's an environmental physicist up on the South Coast. Um, and he cited Elizabeth Cardis's, so Elizabeth is a, a very well-known epidemiologist who spent her life working on radiation exposure, both medical and environmental. And she predicted in a paper, which I was a co-author, I have to admit, that by 2065, so not even now, but by 2065, Chernobyl will have caused about 16,000 thyroid cancers. Now that figure's probably about right. We're about 6,000 of them we've, we've found so far. But there we have another problem. Cancer doesn't equal death. And the death rate from thyroid cancer is about 1%. So there may have been 16,000 cases, but only 160 people will have died. Okay? She also goes on to talk about 25,000 cases of other cancers. I think this is where we have a problem in using the atomic um, bomb exposures to decide what's going to happen. Um, the exposure from Chernobyl was mainly iodine and mainly cesium, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But actually that radiation, particularly the iodine, becomes concentrated in a particular part of the body, and the dose to the rest of the body is very much lower. So to say there's going to be 25,000 cases, I don't think that's right. But we won't know until the lifespan cohort has gone through. So we can't refute that figure, and we'll probably all be dead by the time we would be in a position to do that. So we have an issue there. But the most important thing is what's underneath that, where there's no noughts, compared with several hundred million cancer cases from other causes. Well, hang on, 160 deaths from thyroid, and we're talking about several hundred million cancer, cause, cancer cases from other causes. I'd be slightly more worried about the other causes than the radiation in that context. But you'll very rarely see the death toll, or the cancer toll, put into context with all the other things that cause the same type of disease in humans. This is another slide showing the public perception of radiation, this time from, from Russia. And they were simply asked, the Chernobyl accident happened in 1986. In your opinion, how many people died? Not might die in the future, but died because of the Chernobyl radiation exposure. And the same question about Fukushima. So they were asked this in 2012. Now you can see there's a huge variation in the numbers. But if I tell you the true number is no people died as a result of the Fukushima exposure. None have died since from the radiation, from the consequences of the actions that we took afterwards there have been. Uh, because of the evacuation and things that happened. And if you look at the Chernobyl, it's actually going to be hundreds. At the moment, the death toll is 28 from acute radiation exposure and about 19 thyroid deaths. Okay? So we're not even up to the hundreds yet. But that's not what most people think. So, okay, so where does ionising radiation come from? Well, it's all around us. We can't avoid it, unfortunately. You know, US physicists should know that. Um, we, we eat it in our food. Um, if you have to go into hospital and have a CT scan, I would recommend that you do it, although it is moderately high exposure, because you're having it done for a reason. The chances are you're going to benefit far more from it than the radiation is going to cause you any harm. And of course, even the monkeys in Japan sit in nice spots. That doesn't seem to do them any harm. I don't think it does any harm. And of course, when I get on the BA flight to go across to Japan to talk to people about radiation, I don't see a notice saying, caution, you will be exposed to cosmic rays. But you actually get far more of a dose travelling to and from Japan than you're ever going to get from even standing around the machine. But the problem we have is that we accept all of those. What we can't get into our minds 
is the radiation that comes from atomic bombs and the radiation that comes from accidents. We can't square all that in our heads. Although, of course, the body doesn't care where the radiation comes from. So where does it come from? Well, 50% of your annual uh, exposure comes from radon gas. You can't avoid that. I won't show you the map of Britain because Cornwall hate me for pointing out every time you go to Cornwall you like to breathe far more radon than anywhere else. I did get told off, please do not mention Cornwall any longer in your talks. <laughs> <laughs> so, but actually, I don't notice p people in Cornwall having a problem with that. In fact, most people will prefer to live in Cornwall than live in London. Um, but actually, the 1% that we worry about is 15% comes from medical. 1% comes from everywhere else. And if you look at the, the, the numbers for nuclear discharges and fallout, so that's all of the exposure from what we've done to ourselves, for about 0.3% of our annual dose. So it starts to look as if we have a problem actually understanding the science, and we're believing far too much of the fiction. Now, there are some simple facts. For health effects to be observed, you've got to be exposed to radiation. And you can protect yourself from that exposure relatively easily. The effect will depend on the radioactive isotopes that have been emitted and therefore the ones that you are exposed to. And the dose must be large enough to have a demonstrable effect on the numbers exposed. The problem is that radiation doesn't do anything different to any other toxin that they're exposed to. So radiation doesn't cause specific types of cancer with specific fingerprints. It just increases the frequency. So in order, because cancer is increasing as well because we're living longer and our doctors are getting better at keeping us alive with diabetes and God knows what else, unfortunately, the natural curve for cancer increases with age. So if you're going to look for a very tiny effect that radiation puts on addition to everything else we're exposed to, you've got a very large population. It's a bit difficult getting ethics to expose hundreds of thousands of people to radiation to do the experiment. And that's where we have a real problem. So for radiation to cause damage to cells, it's got to come into contact with them. Now, for isotopes that are alpha or beta emitters, basically that means you need to internalize them. You need to breathe them in or eat them. The mechanism of contact will depend on the type of, of radiation, so waveforms will if it'll, it'll come up from the ground and it'll enter your body, it may not uh, actually interact with anything in your biology, it may go straight away through, because a lot of your body is space. Um, the radiation can be exposure, or it can be, uh, exposure can be external or internal, but the amount of cellular damage depends on the type of radiation. If you can imagine that a helium atom, which is an alpha particle, is a helium nucleus, rather, which is an alpha particle, is a bit like a tetron truck hitting your DNA. Whereas a gamma ray is a more like a bit of a scooter. It will depend on the energy of the gamma. But obviously the effects it has within your cell will depend on the type of radiation. So a helium nucleus hitting your DNA is going to be much, much worse consequences for your cell than some other forms of the radiation. But you've got to ingest an alpha particle. And our dear friend Litvin Yenko was a very good example of what can happen he was actually given polonium-210 in his tea, which, who smokes here? Go on, admit it. Who do you smoke? I don't believe that. Ah. <laughs> Every time you smoke, you breathe in polonium-210. And if, if there's time, I'll show you the proof. And I'll show you that you take in more than a single CT scan if you're an average smoker. Every year you smoke. So don't smoke. And the rest of you who weren't brave enough to admit it, we know you. <laughs> All right. So the health effects depend on physics, biology, and chemistry. And that's why it's so difficult for us to go ahead around this. I found physics very difficult. I've had to learn a lot of physics in the last five years, but I found physics incredibly difficult at school. Biology, not a problem. You find me somebody who can really get their head around all three sciences at the same time, and they must be incredibly bright. They're probably very boring as well, but they must be incredibly bright. <laughs> So the physical half-life means the time that it takes for half of all the atoms to release their radioactivity. Okay? <coughs> the biological half-life, which is the bit the physicists don't get because they're usually not very good at biology at school. I've got a son like that. 
can do physics, you can talk about wave theory forever, but he's not really good on the basics of biology, which is why he's a poor, lonely lad with no girlfriend. Um, <laughs> so the biological half-life depends on how long the radioactive particle stays in your body, and that, to a certain ex extent, depends on your body chemistry. So this is a complicated thing to, to model in order to get the dose. So this is the biological effect. You have a, a, a nice little time bomb of radiation sitting in your cell here. It's nice to you taken in. Um, the amount of time it stays there tells you whether it's likely to release its radioactivity while it's within the cell. So if you have a long physical half-life and a short biological half-life, because all the time your body is turning over things, you may think my body has been like this for years, but it is constantly losing stuff and taking stuff in. That's why we eat, of course. Um, if you have a short biological half-life, you actually have very little effect. So you don't get much of a dose. If you have a short physical half-life and a long biological half-life, you have a big problem. And the best example of this is probably iodine. Iodine-131 has a short half-life of about 8.1 days. Now, the, the thyroid needs iodine to make its thyroid hormones. Without thyroid hormones, your metabolism is completely gone. And if you don't have thyroid hormones early in life, your brain doesn't develop properly. It has a very effective pump mechanism, because iodine actually, normal iodine, is very rarely found. It's, a, it's one of the, the, the rarer elements in the environment. So the thyroid needs to make sure it's got enough. So it's got an active pump mechanism to take it up into the gland. Because it doesn't want to lose it once it's got it, it actually binds the thyroid hormones it makes to a very large protein within the follicular lumen. So it needs the iodine to form the hormones, the hormones are then bound to this big protein called thyroglobulin. Thyro thyro <coughs> now, of course, when those, one of those iodines happens to be radioactive and emits its radiation, it's going to actually hit the cell, okay? So there's the hormone it's releasing, but while it's stored, if it emits it with its radiation, it's going to hit the follicular cell, which is why you get an increase in thyroid cancer when you're exposed to radioiodine. You can also treat thyroid cancer very effectively because you use the same mechanism to get the large doses of iodine into the follicles, into the thyroid cells, to kill the cells off. And it's the best targeted treatment we have for cancer. But small doses, particularly in young children, can cause more of a problem. So the physical half-life of iodine 1 through 1 is 8.1 days. The biological half-life is only about 60 to 80 days. So because the biological half-life is that much greater than the physical half-life, it releases its um, energy, it releases its radiation, and you have a problem because it can interact with the DNA. The other problem we have is the LNT hypothesis. And please, do not invent a hypothesis that you can't test. And we can't test this one. So the evidence that we have that generated by this hypothesis is largely from gamma radiation. So we don't even know for certain that it will hold for all types of radiation. <coughs> um, but you basically can plot a nice line. But unfortunately, most of our data points are up here. But the problem that we have is the doses that we're interested in when we talk about radio protection in terms of both, largely both patients who are undergoing diagnostic procedures and exposure from uh, nuclear uh, accidents is in this area. So our straight line is great for up here. We haven't got a bloody clue what's going on down here, really. It might go that way. It might go that way. But to do the experiments, we'd have to expose very large populations to the very small amounts of radiation. And of course, we're all exposed to very small amounts of radiation. So getting the data to work out what is really going on down here is incredibly difficult. And if the effect of that radiation at those low doses is so small that, it's like, that any effect you see is likely to be caused by other factors, how important actually is the risk? And that's something I think we really need to think about. So this is taken from one of the UNSCEAR reports and there's large amounts of these. They're very good for sort of stopping doors with and things like that. Um, but it actually, what we're most interested in in terms of radiation protection is this dose range down here. And you can read for yourself that you need very large numbers of people to be exposed and the risk is very small. And when you get down here, which is you'll see in the images, the doses we're talking about in terms of Fukushima, um, actually 
You can't see anything. But you can worry about it an awful lot. So if we look at radiation releases in perspective, and the other problem we have with radiation is we have very short memories. You lot won't remember Chernobyl because you weren't born. Um, I remember exactly where I was when Chernobyl happened because it really didn't change my life. Um, but if you look at the A-bomb releases in the 1960s, at the top here, so this was from global testing above ground. So, and some of these were British bombs, so we are not without you know, problems in this. But if you look at the amount of iodine released, and compare it with what was released in Chernobyl and what was released in Fukushima, this is masses more. Now, okay, the iodine was released high in the atmosphere, and by the time it came down to the ground, a lot of it had probably lost its radiation because of its short part of life. But if you look at the cesium, again, you can see this thing dwarfs this, but the cesium hangs around for 30 years. So everybody is focusing on the effects of cesium, but actually we're all exposed to cesium all the time in the at atomic bombs, you know, and um, I don't really think it's doing us that much damage. So what can we do to limit exposure? Well, move away from the source. The inverse square law, if you move one metre away, you reduce, you reduce the dose by 10. Avoid breathing in contaminated air or eating contaminated food. And the Japanese gave some really good advice. They told people not to hang the washing outside, to keep it indoors, to shut the doors and windows. Effectively treating this almost like a chemical contaminant. And that reduced doses considerably. And then they cut the food chain. Because they could. In Japan, it's very easy to bust in food from somewhere else. In a rural economy, it's not quite so easy. So it depends on the state of the country that you're living in as to what you can actually do to help. Wash any particles off your skin to avoid ingestion. So the, so the pictures that you saw on the television of people being hosed down in tents looked horrific. But actually, it's really good because you get rid of everything that's on your skin. And particularly youngsters tend to do like that. And once you've got it inside, it's much more difficult to get rid of them. Um, you can also give stable versions of radioactive isotopes to block uptake, things like stable iodine. But you've got to do that very quickly. You've got to really do that before you have a large release. Um, otherwise, you end up trapping the iodine inside the gun. But the take-home message from all of this is you can do a lot to protect yourself, but the individual doses from nuclear accidents are much, much smaller than we think, or at least the media would lead us to think. So let's look at some of those doses now. This is Ch Chernobyl versus Fukushima. Um, the evacuees around the Chernobyl area had very large doses to their thyroid. I mean, you give much larger doses when you're treating thyroid cancer, but in terms of normal exposure, this is quite high doses. But there was quite a large range. The evacuees had less. And I could never understand why we didn't see any other cancers until I saw a figure quoted that's but at the bottom of that slide, the lifetime exposure from cesium, now rather than iodine, to six million residents was less than a single CT scan each. Many of those people have probably had several CT scans since their exposure. But when you start thinking about anything, hey, blood dose is not very high. No wonder we haven't seen a huge increase of other cancers, because it's such a low dose. And in fact, <laughs> you're exposed to about 100 times that, at least 100 times that, over your lifetime from natural background radiation. Uh, some residents receive more, but there are areas of the world where that's a daily, uh, sorry, an annual amount of 50 millisieverts, and those populations show no increase in cancer. If you look at Fukushima, uh, this is where you have to read things that come out of big organizations like WHO and give very, very carefully. They estimated doses, they didn't have any readings at the time they wrote the report, to be as high as 80 milligrays. When they actually measured the doses in the thyroid, which is where it really matters, the doses were a lot, lot lower, about 4.2. And that's because people had followed the advice. They'd stayed indoors and they hadn't eaten contaminated food. The Japanese don't drink an awful lot of milk anyway. The cows actually were indoors because it was quite cold at the time. So actually, there wasn't an awful lot of uh, iodine in the, in the milk. But people make assumptions when they estimate doses, which turn out not to be true when you actually look at the pattern of what's happened. The estimated lifetime exposure, if they didn't do anything at all to clear up, and I can tell you the Japanese are being incredibly active in clearing up, there are piles of soil everywhere that they have bagged 
and left on the side just to make people feel better about this. But the estimated lifetime exposure is 10 million sieverts if they did nothing at all to clear up. And that's about the average of a, CT, a whole body CT scan. The lifetime exposure to background radiation for most Japanese is about 170 million sieverts. So actually, we're talking about an infinitesimally small amount on top of something else that is much, much larger. And we cope with. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here as a species. If you look at the health effects from Chernobyl, about 28 who died from acute radiation syndrome, these were the guys who were hovering over the well, where they thought the reactor core was, because they couldn't really see very much, because it was, it was very, very um, large pile that was going on and dropping boron to try and stop the, the reactor from working. And they got very large doses, but not all of them died. 134 firemen got acute radiation syndrome. Only 28 of those, 28 of those have died in the, in the few months after the accident. There have been 19 deaths since, but I don't see how a car accident and alcoholism um, is related to radiation. But you know, some people will group those off because they happened to be in the cohort that was exposed. Many of them have gone on to have perfectly normal children and live normal lives. And there's one guy who had a massive dose of 10 sieverts, who is a big, big man. Um, and they reckon his muscle actually protected him because he's so huge. Uh, he is your classical Russian and you know, real Slavic features as well. And he's still going, nearly 30 years later. Um, we reckon there's a 1% death rate, we've got good figures for that that we could predict from thyroid cancer. That would mean about 160 deaths if we had 16,000 thyroid cancers. We've got no scientific evidence of increased thyroid cancer outside the three areas that were closest to the reactor. We have no evidence of effect on fertility, malformation. It's difficult to be conclusive because of course this happened in Soviet Russia. So very short-term effects we find very difficult to, to know the truth. But given the, what we know about the doses, nothing. There's no heritable effects, and it's very unlikely that we see at those doses, and no proven increase so far in any other cancer, including in the liquid eddy cohorts, and these are the guys who cleared up and got bigger doses than the population at large. Fukushima, absolutely no radiation-related deaths, compared with 1,600 well, odd who died of, as, as a result of evacuation or stress related to it, and approximately 20,000 in tsunamis. Now, I was on the television when they just showed a really harrowing clip of a woman who was, it was her husband actually who was talking about, she just put her children over the wall, their parents lived in a brick house, which is unusual in Japan, with a brick wall around it. She put her children over the brick wall to give them to her parents to look after them. She was then swept away, he hadn't seen her since. And they said, now we turn to the disaster, which is Fukushima. Well, I'm sorry, I think it's a bit more of a disaster when 20,000 people die rather than none at all. There's unlikely to be any, and the phrase we're told to use is discernible increase in thyroid cancer, because you can never say there isn't in science, as you know. But there isn't. <laughs> and and I, do, I do mean that. We won't see it. If there is one case, we won't be able to tell it's there anyway. So why worry people about it? The psychological harm due to evacuation and radiophobia is not just very likely, it has happened, and I've spoken to people up there who describe this. There are, there's an awful lot of uh, post-traumatic stress and things like that in the population. And there's a massive economic effect on the local area and Japan as a whole. Most of Japanese energy is now being imported because they can't restart their nuclear power and they rely very heavily on nuclear power because of the public groundswell of opinion that this is dangerous and we're all going to die. It's completely wrong. Now, this is another of my favourite bugbears. Um, this is the lifespan cohort for atomic bombs. Now, the data is fine, but the way it's interpreted may not be. But if you look at the doses on this side, you can see here that actually there's a very small increase in cancer, and these are people who are exposed young and have had 70 odd years now to show their cancers. Um, you can see there's a, a small 10% increase, even after something like the atomic bombs, and this was a heavily studied population as well. Uh, you do have people who say, oh look, this means this dose is protective, but look at the tiny amount of cases in that. 
And I think if David were to tell you about 95% confidence intervals, you'd probably say, actually, if you group all these together, you'd have a reasonable estimate of the increase of cancer. But what is obvious is once you get over that one milli, um, one millisievert to 500 millisieverts here, you do start to see an increase in cancer. So below that dose, we're not talking about massive increases, even from the atomic bombs. So what does it really mean? And this is one of the problems you have. You can talk about percentages, but percentages matter about how many people you've looked at and all the rest of it. You can get very strange impressions from, from percentages taken on their own. So what this really means is there's a hundred, if so, you had a hundred Americans, and I don't know why they chose Americans, probably because they had the figures for, for cancer rates in Americans, but a hundred Americans exposed to a single dose of a hundred milligram. What does that mean in terms of their health? One person, would develop cancer that's attributable to radiation exposure. 42 people would develop cancer due to other causes. And this is based on the atomic bombs uh, data of 100 milligram. Okay. So what are we worrying about? UNSCIR and the WHO reports on Fukushima and the IAEA report, which is due out soon, conclude that the health effects of radiation from Fukushima will be negligible, but the psychological effects on public health will be considerable, which is scientific words for saying a lot. Some conclusion is the same conclusion as the WHO report in Chernobyl, which we actually finished in 2008, but um, politically got delayed until 2011, just before Fukushima happened, as coincidence would have it. So we've actually learned absolutely nothing in 29 years of study because we still had the same gut response to, a health, uh, uh, to the uh, nuclear accident of Fukushima. And we've actually done those populations an awful lot of harm by telling them things that aren't true. So we have to consider the risks and benefits of energy production, and we've got to balance the risks to the environment and the potential health problems that could come from that with those to the individual. Because we do have a real problem here if we consider every potential risk, except the risk of avoiding all risks, we could actually make some very bad decisions here. So there's, you've got to have risks and benefits, and you've got to balance the two. Otherwise, we're going to have a real problem discussing energy going forward. And we all need energy. Because there are no ways of producing energy that are completely risk-free in terms of health. So if you look at, this is, this is quite an old study, if you look at coal, which is what Germany is going back to an awful lot because it's shutting down its nuclear plants, you can see the health impacts of coal-fired energy production are huge. And these are largely respiratory illnesses, um, you know, lung cancers, that sort of thing, because you breathe in an awful lot of the dust from the coal. If you look at nuclear, it's much cleaner in terms of emissions to the atmosphere, and even when you factor in the accidents, and this doesn't take into account Fukushima, well, as we're no deaths, it doesn't really matter anyway. If you look at nuclear, it's much, much cleaner. Now, I have a problem when I show this to the general public. They say, well, you're pro-nuclear. No, I'm presenting you scientific facts. Those are the facts. Just because it happens to show that nuclear is in good light doesn't mean that I'm only selecting the good stuff. This is fact. Now, you need to look at it in another way, because one of the problems we have is trying to get this into the right context for people. How do they get their heads around this? You've got to suspend all your beliefs that you were told as a child that nuclear energy was bad, that atomic radiation was going to kill us all, that radiation is infinitely dangerous, even in tiny amounts, and try and get it into some perspective that you can use in your everyday life. So you're normalising the risk, in other words. So if you live in central London, compared to Inverness, good thing, you've got a job. Starters. Um, but you have a problem with lots of pollution. Okay? And you can increase your mortality in the end just by living in a big city like London. If you live with somebody who smokes, not even smokes themselves, you can also increase your mortality. But if you're one of the Chernobyl emergency workers, actually your mortality increases much, much less. And this, they have much bigger doses in the general population. Look at it another way. If you smoke, 
then you're going to, all your life, you're going to have a problem, you're going to lose 10 years of your life. If you're morbidly obese, and I'll hide over here as I say that, because technically I am, I do the same damage to my health as if I smoked all the time. And this is becoming more and more of a problem in this country. But actually, if I was one of the unfortunate people who was quite close to where the bombs were detonated, about one and a half kilometers away, actually my risk and my number of years of life lost is much lower than being fat. Puts it into a bit of perspective, doesn't it? So the take home messages are, all types of energy generation have risks and benefits. We've got to separate fat from fiction to decide our future energy policy. The effects of climate change are likely to kill 150,000 people per year. How we generate energy affects climate change. We've got to start having proper grown-up discussions about this. Politics, as we all know, gets in the way of good science. Um, and you have to be aware of political spin on absolutely everything in science, not just nuclear energy. Don't believe everything you read on the internet or in the media, and you'll find if you ever end up in the press like David and I have ended up, if you Google yourself, it's quite painful actually, some of the things that are said about you, so you don't bother Googling yourself any longer. But make sure that you understand the facts before you try and make sense of the science. And just quickly, I'll just do, I've got two quizzes, but I'll just do one with you now. Here's a dose quiz for you. These, this is what we do in the centre of, uh, if any of the nuclear engineering guys here, don't you dare answer because you know the answer to this. Or if you don't, you should do. Um, here's a dose quiz. Now, who wants to tell me what they think the top dose is on there? Anybody? Shout it down. Brazil nuts. <laughs> well, I hope not. Um, the top, the highest dose, sorry, not the lowest, the highest dose. Make that clearer. Radiotherapy Radio for breast cancer. Breast cancer. Now, do you think that um, 150, 135 grams of Brazil nuts is higher or lower than the dental x ray? Dental x ray. Dental x ray is higher. No, I'd say the Brazil nuts are higher. Brazil nuts are higher. Brazil nuts are higher <laughs> than dental x-ray. They're actually the same. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Brazil nuts have actually set off radiation detectors in some power stations. They're that sensitive. Chest x-ray is about 0.2 millisieverts. Um, it's a lot worse for me flying back and forth to Tokyo, which I'll do three times this year. Uh, that's our annual UK dose. A CT scan is about 10 millisieverts. It does vary depending on the type of scan you have. The average dose to 6 million residents at Chernobyl is roughly the same as the TT scan. The radiotherapy for breast cancer is 50 sieverts, but of course we don't give it one dose because that does tend to kill a patient, which doesn't <laughs> <laughs> So we fractionate the dose. But even then, it's still quite a high individual dose that you're giving each time. But many breast cancer patients go on to live for years and years afterwards. And very few of them actually get other cancers. 100 millisieverts is the level at which we start to see an increase in cancer in the population, but only in very large studies. And this is my last slide, especially for the gentleman who said he's fun. This is great fun. If you want to go and look at this, you can calculate your own dose and you can put in various parameters. So if you look at things like you know where you live, the type of house you live in, you can put that in. Um, fallout from nuclear weapons is in there as well. The interesting thing for those inter in interested in energy production, if you live within 60 kilometers of a coal-fired power plant, your dose is actually much higher than if you live any anywhere close to a nuclear power plant. Because when you burn the product that you use to, to burn coal, you end up with radiation in the atmosphere. And for my friend over there, there's your dose from one pack of cigarettes a day. So are we worried about the health effects of nuclear accidents and nuclear power? I think we should be looking a bit closer home to see the effects that other things we do to ourselves quite voluntarily can have on our health. Thank you very much. We've got some time for some questions now, and I've been asked by the organisers to repeat the questions through this microphone. 
so that they're captured by the recording, which means you need to make your question simple enough for me to understand. Okay. So hands up if you've got a question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned sort of uh, the psychological effects of uh, uh, people being evacuated at Fukushima. How many people would have died from uh, radiation exposure had there been no evacuation? No. Nothing at all. Okay, let me, just, let me just repeat it quick. You spoke very loudly. So that's great. <laughs> uh, that was mentioning psychological effects of evacuation. How many people would have died from Chernobyl if there had been no uh, from Fukushima? Sorry, if there had been no evacuation. Um, the, a the answer is none, because the doses were that bad. There was not as much radiation emitted anything like Chernobyl. Uh, and in actual fact, if we treated it more like we do with a chemical spill, um, and we've, we've had chemical exposures in this country, from places like Flixborough and things like that, what do we tell the population to do? Stay inside, shut your windows and doors, don't go outside. Once that radio ID cloud has passed over, there's actually very little to worry about because most of the heavy isotopes that will come out in any form of exposure will stay very close to the nuclear power plant. Things like cesium and iodine are what we worry about. Cesium, uh, iodine is has a very short half-life of eight days. Within three months, all of the iodine's gone. So all the restrictions on iodine-containing foods could be, could be released from that. The cesium, we have absolutely no evidence that it causes an increase in cancer because it has a long half-life and short biological half-life. And it doesn't concentrate in any particular <coughs> tissue body. Okay, let me just follow up to that because I do remember Chernobyl. When I was 13 years old, my dad brought home a Geiger oh, counter, uh, and uh, it, it, was, it was it was raining. Um, but I seem to remember the UK government decided to restrict dairy from Wales because it, inevitably it was raining in yeah. Wales, uh, <laughs> and, and that was cesium. Yeah. So Absolutely. that was completely over the top. Yeah, I mean the problem we have is everything is always precautionary, yeah. and if you're imagining you're in government, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. And so the precautionary principle says just, just don't say anything you drink it because it's probably safer that they don't. But we actually don't have any evidence for that. Um, and that's why they've said, uh, you know, don't drink anything from Wales because it does rain a lot in Wales. Um, and until recently, there were still restrictions on the sheep in Wales. Yes. Um, I think possibly not because of the radioactivity, but because the farmers quite enjoy the subsidies. Um, and you know, that when you start paying people not to, to do something, you have a real problem because nobody wants that to stop. And so the science can say what it likes, but the political lobby can be, no, no, we need to keep it quiet, we need to keep paying them. And that's what's happened a lot in Fukushima as well. They were paid to stay evacuated so many people don't want to move back because they'll lose the payment. There aren't the jobs. Right, thank you. Uh, okay, Vadim. Um, you mentioned that if there is a, a disaster at a nuclear plant, you should just kind of start eating some food that's produced locally. But for instance, in Japan, can you just wait out and start fishing again? Yeah. Fish in the neighborhood? So this is a question about whether in uh, about food restrictions yeah, uh, in the, from the vicinity of uh, yeah, a nuclear plant plant yeah, accident. Well, what about fishing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's a huge issue in Japan at the moment because what they've done, being Japanese, they have tried to make everything so much purer than it was before they started, is their sort of attitude. And they have got masses of water tanks. I've been to the power plant, I'm due to go again in May, where they have water that's gone through all the cleaning procedures, removed all the nasties, and they're left with tritium. Right? And I'm thinking, I could drink that, most of that water there, absolutely no problem at all for the dose it's going to give me. But the fishermen are scared stiff that if people know it's being released into the, the ocean and they fish the fish, nobody wants to reach the fish. And there was actually something on the, on the Independent, I think it was last week, because I was asked to write a piece about it, saying that you know, we could be getting radioactive food from Fukushima because there's unscrupulous people who are putting it in processed products, products and selling it in the UK, and we've no way of monitoring that. Well, good luck to you. I mean, the amount of radiation is very, very tiny. But there are people who have developed coping strategies. And I went to one village in Itati, which is one of the areas where the plume went, they hadn't realized where the wind was going. Uh, so they actually had more than they were expected to have up there. And I said, well, you know, because they're all local farmers then. So well, how do you cope? Well, we have a detector that we got from Belarus, which they put in a shielded room. Um, and they measure their local produce. And I said to them, has it ever exceeded the limits? And the Japanese limits are lower than they are in, in Europe. So any Japanese food, if it's passed its safety procedures, is going to be a hell of a lot lower than, than anything in, in this country. Um, and they said, um, no, nothing's ever, nothing's ever gone over the top, but we just feel safer. 
if we can look at it ourselves. And I said, well, fine, carry on. If that's, your, that's the way you cope with it. But actually, the cesium contamination, I don't think have any effect on health. It's the iodine, and that's milk and leafy green vegetables. And don't give it to children. If I took in, in radioactive iodine, it wouldn't do a thing to my thyroid gland, because my thyroid gland is not dividing. Once you get to about 40, your thyroid gland stops dividing. So what causes the problem in terms of the cancer is the radiation and the fact that the gland is dividing. So once that stops, and really once you get about 20, you can take in quite a lot of radioactive iodine with no effect at all. But those are the key things to do. So three months, and it's all gone from the environment. So they could have started eating the food again. And in Chernobyl, they didn't actually cut off the food supply because they couldn't, because the economy was so uh, rural. And so they carried on eating contaminated food. That was dangerous, in inverted commas, while the iodine was present in the environment. Once that had gone, they could have just carried on as per normal. Thank you. Uh, there was a question in the middle of the back. Um, you said the numbers that were evacuated from Fukushima, that there were 1,600 deaths yep. for evacuation. That seems like a ridiculously high number. I mean, there's 20,000 deaths from tsunami. That's 5 to 10% of the people died from the evacuation. Could you yep. quantify how they died from these stress? I don't know understand how they would have died so from this, the evacuation. So this is just a query about the figure that 1,600 people died in the evacuation from Fukushima. What can, we learn? what can we learn from that? Because that's uh, uh, well, what, what other things is don't move sick people. Because a lot of those were people in hospitals who moved, not because it was, you know, they really needed to, but because the doctor said, I'm scared I'm getting out of it. Which you would hope the medical profession would have a bit of more handle on this. Actually, they don't. And that was, for me, one of the worrying things, is when you talk to a lot of people who you think should know a bit more, actually are scared of something that they don't need to be scared of. And it, it was a big sort of wake-up call that the medical profession has to be better armed in these situations. So there were, there were people who were moved because they were, they, they were really too old to move. You have to, you have to understand what happens in Japan. If you have lots of older communities, this place is only two hours on the train from Tokyo. So most of the youngsters have either moved to Tokyo, before the accident now, moved to Tokyo, or were commuting to Tokyo. Okay. So you have a predominantly older population. Of course, when you start dislocating older people, that causes an awful lot of stress. And quite a few of them, them die from the results of stress. And also, the Japanese have a passion for their land. They have spent generations living in the same place. It is their land. They grow everything on it. They really believe everything that comes from it is good. When you put a population under stress and say, I'm terribly sorry, your land is contaminated, you'd never be able to eat anything again, and you're going to move away from it. It causes an awful lot of stress. Um, and also, the press did not help. If you look at what was being said about some of the people who were helping in the power station, they were almost treated as if they were lepers, as if radiation was, was uh, catching. Um, and you know, they were blamed for not, not doing as, as, as well as they could have done and all sorts of things. There's a whole variety of different stresses that have come in on that population that you know, resulted in a figure like that. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that's what we've got time for. No surprise that such a great talk has provoked so many questions. Um, but let's thank Jerry again for...